fun pleasure to introduce to you legendary coach um, of uh, such programs as Univers uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Washington State, Mississippi State, Texas A&M. Let's welcome in Jackie Sherrill. Jackie, how are you doing today, buddy? Doing good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm just going to move this film around. There we go. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, we can hear you great. Let me ask you something, Coach. I always wanted to ask you this. You had the pleasure um, in your playing days. I want to even go back before your coaching days of playing for the great coach, um, Bear Bryan at Alabama. I believe you won two national championships over there as well. Compare the way Coach Bryan even coach before you got into coaching and compare it, how is it different from the way today's coaches coach? Well, the biggest thing is the preparation and certainly the uh, time that you'll spend in the off season. Uh, a lot of us would probably be put in jail today <laughs> if we did the things that we did back then. So uh, it's changed uh, probably – uh, put it best, Lou Holtz talking to him the other day and Coach Holtz said, you know, coaching the millennials today, you, you got to smile and, and just say yes, yes, yes. Uh, back then, Coach Bryant never said yes. So uh, the things we went through, but all of us and even the kids that I coach that typically that put you through some tough practices – uh, you were able to carry that off in your life because life's not easy as well. One thing that was said this week, and I agree to, if if you look at Alabama practice, they go after each other. Their practice are, are physical. And I've always said your job as a coach is to prepare your players mentally practice your players, but practice them very physical that the game that they play in is easier than your practices. And then the most important is put the players in the right position and then get out of the way and let them perform. So you analyze all that. When you say prepare, uh, you have to prepare the players for everything. And today, and we'll take quarterbacks, uh, you know, when you have a quarterback that goes to the line of scrimmage and then always doesn't go to the line of scrimmage, they're in shotgun, but they look over to the sideline, there's five seconds left on the play clock. Uh, you can't tell me they know what the defenses are. You can't tell me that they know that that wide defensive end may be unblocked. So, you know, when you look at those things, how much are you really helping your quarterback today but not allowing him to see what he's getting ready to face? So, but that's where we are. And you see so much miscommunication between the quarterbacks and receivers today. Uh, yeah. You know, um, you, you know, quarterbacks today and – what we see, and certainly when you look at uh, old Mrs. Quarterback, uh, you know, I call them the University of Mississippi. And, uh, but when you look at their quarterback in the way that he can throw and run, then you look at other quarterbacks around the country that are mobile, uh, you have one more person. But that, that, don't take that away from guys that, that can stand in the pocket and throw it. But Again, you have to give him the protection uh, that the, the coaches don't have in their arsenal today because they're they're moving or having the quarterback be able to move in the pocket and run. And but if you go back to the to the great quarterbacks, every one of them could make one guy miss them. You know, what's the difference in an average quarterback and, and that gets sacked a bunch or a quarterback that doesn't get sacked? He just has that ability to make that one guy miss him that gives him the extra time uh, 
uh, in the pocket or the extra time to look downfield to find somebody else. Now, Coach, um, you also had the pleasure of being an athletic director as well as a head coach. Talk about how college football, since you began coaching, how's, you know, how it evolved um, today in, from the time you coached to today into a billion-dollar industry, NIL, et cetera, and do you like the way it is today, or do you think it was better – the way, you know, kids weren't making as much money, obviously, or any money when you were coaching. Well, I think, you know, every young man today deserves the, uh, do I like the NIL? Yes. There's no uh, reason that we should not have the name, image, and likeness. But for all these years, uh, up until the year that Oklahoma in Georgia sued the NCAA, and that was in the late 70s, uh, 78, I think. Uh, until that time, the NCAA controlled everything. They controlled the TV, the contracts, and then you, you look at the lawsuit, the lawsuit, very clear, that the universities own the right, the individual, of their proprietary rights. So you fast forward and you have the players. Uh, the players have a right of their individual proprietary rights, whether that's signatures or whatever, pictures. And the, the ability, is it going to change college football? No. I don't, I don't see the quarterback at Alabama being a bad quarterback because he's making money off of his name image. I saw a young man that played extremely way above his years. He doesn't. He did not look like he was actually a sophomore or a freshman playing. Right. And you look at other quarterbacks. So I, the name, the image, and likeness is not going to destroy football teams like, you know, a lot of people think it is. Uh, so now you go back, you still have to earn the right to play. It, it, just because uh, you're on a football team, that doesn't give you the right to be the starting quarterback or the right to be the starting guard. So you still have to earn that in, in football or any sport. But to go forward, uh, you know, it's changing. We all change. You know, you didn't have this show years ago either. You wouldn't have the opportunity. We didn't have, you know, the IT tools. So every day it changes. So, you know, uh, you know, the coaches that have the ability to understand and use all the tools. Now, the one person, you know, we all talk about Nick Saban. And next, there's no question about uh, how progressive and how good he is. But you got to give credit to uh, the AD, Mal Moore, that hired Nick Saban. Because Mal Moore allowed Nick to do whatever he needed to do to build Alabama. Nick, on the other hand, was the first coach that brought in the pro style coaching. When I say that, that's not, but I'm talking about the staff organization. He's the first coach that had uh, analysts. He's the first coach that had, you know, in-house recruiter and first coach that had high school relations coaches. And you look at the staff today, you know, there's 30 or 40 guys that's on his staff, but they all have a job. And then you look at the NIL, and I, I said this when it came out, that Nick will be way ahead of everybody else, and he's hired probably either five or ten people just to handle the NIL with his players, you know, to educate them, teach them how to uh, progressively go out and, and use their name, image, and likeness to get uh, some deals and get some advertising. So – 
you know, it will be a long time before some of these coaches uh, will have the ability to catch Alabama. I'm talking about in what they do simply because they're not as forward thinking and they're not as progressive. Nick, Nick, you know, he has a psychiatrist and psychologist that helped his football team and help and you listen to his players talk uh they're very well versed and they also say the right things i was impressed you look at and and i'll use jimbo fisher you know jimbo worked for for nick but jimbo is very progressive and you hear his players talk in a press conference uh they are very intelligent and they say uh the right things and and most of the players, I'm talking about at AM or Alabama, they will be saying what Nick or Jimbo say tells them during the week. Now, Coach, let me ask you this. Before we get into your college coaching career and hit some of the highlights, I always wondered, I know you coached at Washington State, know you coached at Pittsburgh, know you coached at Texas A&M, and know you coached at Mississippi State. But ever, ever during your coaching career, if the opportunity come came up, did you want to go to Alabama and coach at your alma mater? Well, I had, uh, I was involved at one time uh, in that process. Uh, you know, they went another direction, but would I have gone? Uh, absolutely, I would have gone. Uh, when I interviewed for my first job, and that was Washington State. During the interview, they were afraid that I was just going to come in and leave. And so they asked me uh, about that. And I said there were only two jobs I would leave for, and that would be Alabama or Pittsburgh. And so they didn't think that Coach Bryant was going to resign, nor did they think that Coach Major. So uh, they were okay with that. Now, let's talk about Pittsburgh a minute because when you listen to the fist football historians out there, you know, the, one of the teams that they say was probably one of the best put-together teams of any team in college football was that 1980 uh, Pittsburgh team where you had so much talent, national championship, uh, and you had so many people, just a couple of – for the fans out there, Hugh Green, uh, Mark May, Jimbo Covert, Russ Grimm, Ricky Jackson, Carlton Williamson, Tim Lee uh, Lewis, and Dan Marino. Talk about that team, Coach, how it was put together, which obviously by you, and how special was that 1980 team? Uh, very special. You know, they were they, they, the players. Uh, there were three first rounders, uh, 11 in the first seven rounds. And I think 18 uh, guys off of that team went to fall camp. I mean, pro camp, but the backup players, we had, you know, players like uh, Chris Dolman ended up in the hall of fame. He was a backup player. We had Bill Moss that played at Kansas city. Great, great player. He'll probably be in the hall of fame one day. Uh, so you, the backup players, and you know, we we had the depth uh, that it took, and you know, if the head coach had been better uh, and coached a little better in one game, you know, we would have won the national championship. I don't know who that dummy was, but you know, <laughs> we go to Florida State and like a, and I made a couple of mistakes. The biggest mistake, you know, we had kids from. Florida. We had kids from Georgia and Mississippi on the team. So I allowed them to, and we played a night game. So during the, the afternoon, we had some time in there that I allowed uh, the players to have their parents come by and say hello because they hadn't seen them in a while. Well, it wasn't just the parents. It was, you know, the first, second, and third cousins showed up and, you know, the friends of those cousins. So we were not ready to play until the second half. And the other thing I did, they, at that time, they were the best in punt blocks. They were the first team in the country that actually would overload 
uh, five or six guys on a punt block on one side, and they were very good. So we had a freshman punter. I worked extremely hard in protection, and we could protect, but we didn't cover. Uh, you know, we kept giving a, bit, a field a fit, a position all the time. They kicked five field goals uh, in the game to win the game, and they were not short field goals. They were 40 and 48 yarders. And, <clears throat> but if we had had five minutes left in the game, we, we, we would probably had a chance to come back and win it. But, <clears throat> you know, I did a very poor job, and that one game cost us, you know, the championship that year. Now, Coach, when did you know or did you – I mean, there's always things when players progress. You never can tell, you know, how far – you can only imagine how far they can possibly go as they develop on the man and go in the NFL. But did you realize when you were coaching Dan Marino that he would be as legendary as he became as a quarterback? Well, when he was in high school. He was a man playing with, with kids. Uh, I mean, you know, Danny was not small. Danny was 6'4 plus, and, and he could throw. You know, baseball was uh, a, a, his, probably his first choice. And I was very fortunate uh, that he chose to come to Pitt and play football instead of signing with the Kansas City. And, you know, they – Matter of fact, I'm sitting at the table when they send uh, the the scout or representative to sign it. And, you know, they had the check there. They had everything. And and just so happened the NCAA, you had, you had Danny Ainge from BYU. You had Kurt Gibson of, of Michigan State. You also had uh, a, a player that was going to Maryland. All three were great baseball players, and they did go off and play baseball. Uh, you know, Danny Ainge played basketball and baseball and Kirk football. But at that time, you could sign a major league baseball and still go and play college football. Well, they arbitrarily set the NCAA sitting around the table arbitrarily, and it was not a body meaning the government of the body, the presidents did not vote on this. They just interpreted the rule that if you sign a major league contract, you could not go play college football unless you paid for it. So here's kids like Danny, that if he signed a major league baseball, would have to pay his way to Pitt to play baseball, I mean football. So I'm sitting in the room and the, the scout or the representative said that we're going to move George Brett to first base and you would be, you'll be our third baseman. And I looked at him and I said, repeat that, please. And he did. And when he said, we'll move George Brett or to first base and you would play third base. And knowing what kind of player George Brett was, I looked at him and I said, there's not enough zeros on this check. You're not telling the truth. And so fortunately, Danny didn't sign to go play Major League Baseball, uh, came to Pitt. But he was a man when he was playing in high school. Uh, I told him early on when he first as a freshman, and we I filmed him, uh, his throwing motion. And I asked Danny, I said, Danny, who taught you how to throw? And Danny says, my dad. I said, well, what did he say to you? He said, the ball goes up and out. And you really think about it. You had all these gurus at the time were telling you your elbow had to be here. Your arm had to be a certain place. And which is not really true as long as that ball goes up and out. And so I told Danny, I said, Danny, you'll have a lot of people try to change your throwing motions for the rest of your life. Uh, you let it go in one ear and out the other. You did not change anything. And that stuck with him because even today, Danny will say that he had people trying to change him. And he remembered 
what I said, and he wouldn't listen to him. But, you know, when you come across a kid like that, or Tony Dorsett, Hugh Green, Ricky Jackson, I mean, you go on and on, uh, Jimbo Colbert, uh, those guys. But that reminded me, Jimbo Colbert just went into the Hall of Fame, but Danny's offensive line at Pitt was from left to right was Jimbo Colbert, Ebo Boys that played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Russ Grimm that played for Washington at Hall of Fame, uh, Bill Fralick that played in Atlanta will be in the Hall of Fame, and then Mark May, so played for the Redskins. So that was his offensive line. Uh, I don't know if he had that good of a line in Pro Bowl. Right, right. Now, you go to Texas A&M, Coach, and talk about which you got known for the 12th man kickoff team that you implemented. How did that all come about? Where did the idea come from? They still today do some form of it, but how did that all come about? Well, uh, you know, at that time, they built the bonfire, uh, and they built it, but they started in September. They would cut 5,000 trees would be cut, but they – the Texas right away, which was the uh, power company, would have a right away to go through and, and cut. Well, they allowed a &M students to go in and cut the trees. But there's uh, that's just part of the story. They had to carry the trees out of the woods by hand. Now, you're talking about trees anywhere from, you know, eight inch in, in diameter to six feet. And so it was amazing how they would take sticks or underneath and there'd be 20 guys picking up that, that tree and carrying it out of the woods. And there were 5,000 trees cut and they cut, capped them at 10 foot. They would stack them by size, but they would build six, they had four stacks and then put the outhouse on the top. So basically six uh, stacks. And I started working on the bonfire. I stopped one night. And they, one of the red pots said, do you want to go up on the fourth stack? And I said, sure. Well, they put me in a stirrup of a crane and they swung me back and forth. And of course the students were laughing at, at that dumb football coach up there and looked, we're making him look stupid. And, but anyway, I go, I'm up on the four stack and wiring the, the, the logs and they would take the log and they would bring it up by a crane. And then you would take it and wire it to two other logs. Well, all of a sudden, one of the guys working on the four stack said, you want to go home? I said, no, I'm enjoying myself. And he said, you want to go home? I said, no, I'm enjoying myself. I'm, I'm okay. He said, no, you're going home. So they sent me down. They had what they called a go home rope. And it was a two inch rope that you actually sl slid down. So the guy at the end kept raising and lowering the go home rope. So here I am sliding up and down, going down the go home rope and burning my hands. And, and the kids were laughing like crazy. You know, here's that dumb football coach that's <laughs> coming down the go home rope. But anyway, when I saw him pass the Red Pots, uh, the Red Pots picked his successor. And the Red Pots are the ones that build the bonfire. And they start in, in when school starts and they go all the way through, I don't think a red pot at, at that time actually went to class. Matter of fact, I think the professors came and brought their uh, their tests to them whenever they had tests or they just didn't take them. But anyway, when I saw him pass the red pots, there was a 55 gallon drum. There was a little bonfire and they were about 20 yards from the stack and it, the the red pot was beating the drum with an axe handle. So he slid vertically down when he stopped beating the drum, they vertically slid down the stack. And that means you're cutting your hands because you got all that wire, you're sliding vertically down with, 
with nothing. And they run over and the first one bent over and he took three slats with the ax handle. And then he said, take your best shot. And so the guy hit him, the red pot hit him the fourth time and the ax handle broke. So when the ax handle breaks, you start all over. So now he took seven slats. I knew what that felt like. Because when I went through a club, I had to get two slats on Saturday. We got slatted during the week. You know, it hurt, but didn't hurt. And um, through some other things, but uh, I got slatted Saturday morning and my knees hit the top of the coat box. And I said, I ain't taking another another slat. And there ain't anybody here big enough to make me either. So that, that's my sophomore year. And I walk out and a senior comes and gets me and says, let me give you, you, know, you, you got to get it to join the A club. But anyway, so I knew what that felt like. No expression, nothing. I said, I, it's 40,000 students here. I can find guys that cover it can cut i can teach them how to cover kickoffs and how and in my mind at that time i had a little kid and i'm talking about very little probably five six maybe uh glennie meyer at the university of pittsburgh that was the best cover guy i ever had on kickoffs and so and he wasn't on scholarship uh so that assured me that we could find we had 252 sign up had two young ladies and we whittled that down to 40 and had 40 come out for spring practice <clears throat> every year and would keep 20 and so they earned their spot and they they were good to give you an idea for five years they were t number one in the nation two years they all were always were in the top five their average was 12.5 last year i looked it up and of the major universities alabama was number one but they were uh, like 18.5 or 16.5 they still even today would have been number one in the nation hmm. uh I want to make sure I get um, Zach in here. I'm not sure. I want to make sure you get some questions in, my friend. Oh, I appreciate it. So, yeah, um, I'm a big recruiting guy. That's like my thing. I love talking recruiting. So, you know, you're still involved, really involved in college football. Looking back at your coaching career till now, how has recruiting differed? And when you were scouting a player, what were the number one things you were looking for? Well, you have to have talent. So the first thing you look at is, you know, their speed, then you look at the player that what position and you're recruiting to a position. Yeah, you're recruiting offensive linemen and today you're looking at the big guys and but can can they move? Do they have flexibility? Can can they move their feet? You know, just because you have size that doesn't mean and one thing that I always did with my offensive linemen that were recruited, I would ask them to squat and if they could squat without keeping well keep keeping their feet on the ground and still squat but if they had to raise their heels that meant that they they could not play because once they get in a stance they could not have their feet on flat on the ground and so they means they're top heavy uh, same thing uh, when you're looking at quarterback you know, we all think that, you know, quarterbacks got to have a strong arm. Yeah, you do, but one of the, the best quarterbacks in the in the SEC for years was Danny Warfel. Danny Warfel could not make it in pro ball, but what Danny could do, and there's one thing that's so important, is you have to throw catchable balls. So can the quarterback throw catchable balls? You know, it, in the difference in college, in college you may have a window this big. In pro ball, you may have a window this big. I asked Kenny Staber years ago uh, in 
when he was in Oakland. I said, Kenny, what's the difference between college and pro ball in quarterbacks? And he said, Jackie, we're standing in a large banquet room. It was like 40 yards from one end to the other. And he says, if you can't throw the ball from here to the other end without touching the ceiling and throw it into the window, you can't play in this league, which makes sense. And even today, you you know, you, you look at two of the greatest quarterbacks last year or all time, you know, one played it at uh, uh, New Orleans and the other one ended up playing at Tampa. And, uh, you know, Breeze and and, uh, and Brady, but you know Drew could not throw. He didn't have the arm to throw at ninety yards, but he could throw the ball and throw it where people could catch it. The receivers catchable ball. So I mean, it's kind of like Major League Baseball. You know, you have a lot of pro baseball players in the Hall of Fame that could never throw 90 miles an hour, but they could hit that target and they had balls that they could move around to hit that target, but they couldn't throw the fastball. But, you know, Nolan Ryan was a, a different type of, of player. Same thing with quarterbacks. You look at quarterbacks today and you look at Wilson or you look at Mahomes, but you look at quarterbacks today or Kyler Murray, you know, those guys, first thing you would say, looking in, in Johnny Manziel, they were baseball players. They were shortstops or third basemen because they could throw the ball from every direction. And, you know, you saw Bryce the other day, and Bryce throws the ball at different angles. Uh, you know, so the, the gurus years ago that the, you know, your, your elbow had to be here, the ball had to be here, you, you know, that was never true. Uh, you know, just get the ball to the receivers that they can catch. Right. And I mean, for, for me also, you know, you recruited at such different areas. I mean, P Pittsburgh's a big city. A&M is a powerhouse program that's that's easier to recruit at. But how hard was it to recruit to Starkville and Pullman, Washington? We see that, you know, the well, big markets. Say, we had Ames, Iowa in there too now. So don't yeah. forget about <laughs> Ames or Fayetteville, Arkansas. So, oh, you know, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Ames, Iowa, and Pullman, Washington. Uh, uh, you have the advantage in major cities. Uh, however, you have to recruit to your university. You know, when I was at Pittsburgh and Texas A&M, one of the first things I'd ask uh, a recruit, do you want concrete under your feet or do you want grass? If I was at Pittsburgh and they said grass, I, I knew we were not going to get them. If I was at A&M and they said grass, we had, yeah, we got a chance to get you. Well, the, the most important thing that I did is I wanted to see the player in the reaction with his mother. I could care less. That's not true. But, I mean, you know, and his father, but I wanted to see a player around his mother because if a player respected his mother and was very honest and, and you could see where they loved their mother or not, then you knew, I mean, I did. I felt like that I could coach that kid. A kid that was not respectful to his mother, I wasn't going to recruit. And I didn't. And there's quite a few players I walked out of the house. And, wow. you know, uh, that was the same thing with Coach Bryant. Uh, the, the coaches hated for Coach Bryant to go visit in their homes because they may be recruiting a player for two years and Coach Bryant would walk in there in five minutes. He said, let's go, because he wasn't going to take them. Uh, and I judge, I judge kids uh, on two things. I'm talking about, you know, players, how they respect older people and how they respect kids and especially handicapped kids. 
I, when I started taking our kids to the hospitals in 1977 at Pittsburgh, uh, I was <clears throat> wanted to find out you can learn an awful lot about your players when you take them to a, a kid's hospital. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the meanest, the nastiest, the toughest players were always the best in the hospitals. And I, at first I didn't understand it. And it was basically because they had more compassion, even though they were tough and mean and nasty on the field. And they were exposed to kids in their life, probably their family or other fa uh, family members that were handicapped. Uh, and the worst kids were the nice kids. Well, what was the difference? Well, they had never been exposed to those, you know, the kids that were handicapped. So uh, there's a lot of ways to evaluate players. The biggest mistake I made in recruiting, and he ended up being a great player. Matter of fact, he, was, uh, <clears throat> uh, he played for SMU and came out of Beaumont. And so our coach, assistant coach goes down there and he calls me and he says, you know, that some of the coaches says he doesn't have, you know, good character uh, or questionable character. I said, we don't want him then. Well, that was Jerry Ball. And Jerry Ball was a great player at SMU. So we're getting ready to play SMU his freshman year. And I'm watching him go from sideline to sideline, making every play. And I called the assistant coach in and I put the film on. And I said, you got to understand that if a player plays for 60 minutes from sideline to sideline, he doesn't have any character issues. I said, we made the big, or you made a big mistake listening to a high school and you didn't do your homework on the kid. And we lost a great player because Jerry Ball wanted to, to come to a and And <clears throat> there's, there's been kids that sitting in front of the mother, I, I would tell them, I'm sorry, I'm not recruiting and get up and walk out. Right. And I mean, the last question for me, at least, is one of the biggest changes from when you were coaching to now is the transfer portal and how freely players can move back and forth, especially with the one time transfer rule. Now, how, how does that change a coaching job, in your opinion? And for you, do you think well, it's it a good thing for college football? <clears throat> it helps a lot of schools uh, that would not get those kids to begin with. And you'll see kids that will go play somewhere else. And that may be a, a, a step down, but end up playing and being a great player for them. I, but on my side, meaning as the head coach <clears throat> at the places I was at, if a kid didn't want to be there, let him go. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if either one of you have kids, uh, but, you know, players are like kids. You know, you have to be, and I've always said this, if you're smarter than the fifth grader, you can't play. I mean, can't coach. And when I say that, if you're smarter than the fifth, fifth grader, you can't coach, people look at me like, what, what do you mean? Well, it's very simple. A fifth grade teacher is the hardest grade to teach because at that time, the, matur the maturity that they have, that's when they change socially, they change mentally, they change. That's when the kids actually start changing because they're 10 years old or, or 11 years old and they're becoming a young adult. So uh, if that is meaning that you have a whole group of class of students you have to teach and relate to all of them as a football coach you have to relate to every player and you got to figure out how to relate to them and i i always laughed i got a couple of kids that are doctors today players 
And I remember one of them kind of rolled in his eyes in a meeting one time. And, and he was smart enough to know that what I was saying may not be the whole truth. And, you know, so, uh, you know, as a coach, you have to be, if you're smarter than a thrift, fifth grader, you can't coach. But I learned a lesson. One of the smartest uh, people, and I'm talking about neuroradiologists, spent 30 years of making a device of the brain, meaning everything in the brain to be able to not only pull it up on a computer, but to show it where it is in the brain. And if there's a damage in the brain, they can show what it is, why it is. And she made a comment down there watching it. And she made a comment. I wrote it for a fifth grader. And so I started laughing. I said, well, I must be pretty smart then. <laughs> Coach, before we let you go, um, because we're running out of time here, there is one last question I want to ask you. And you've been a coach. You've been a player. You've been an AD, and of course, you've been a fan of the game of college football. I want to know the different perspectives you have from each of those on realignment and these schools going to different conferences and how it would affect a player, a coach, an AD, and even the recruits that you go after. And is it a good thing or a bad thing for college football? Well, I, I did a TV show in 1978, January of 78, Houston, Texas. I did an hour show. I drew the had a map of the U.S. I drew four conferences and said that we'll end up with 16 to 20 teams in four conferences. That was in 1970, uh, no, 1989, excuse me, January of 1989. And that we would have four conferences and 16 to 20 teams in each conference. Now, let's spin it all back. You know, everybody's talking about the SEC. The SEC didn't make the first move. The Big Ten made the first move. The reason the Big Ten did was they were cut off at the Ohio border. They did not have Pennsylvania in New York, New Jersey. The number one TV market uh, is in, let me clear this out, I'm sorry. The number one TV is in New York. Well, to get them to the Eastern Seaboard, they went and picked Ohio of Penn State because Penn State could get them to the Eastern Seaboard. So the Big Ten was the first. It wasn't the SEC. So later when the SEC was talking about expansion, and this was with Roy Kramer, because it all comes down to footprints eyeballs. And, and I read an article the other day that footprint doesn't make any, uh, that's wrong. Footprints is the number of people that are going to support and watch college football. And <clears throat> when you have the Pac-12 tw uh, now, but 10 years ago, the Pac-12 wanted go to go to Pac-16. And so they wanted Texas, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, you know, Colorado. They were going to the Pac-16. Well, what killed the deal was the Pac-10 presidents that were not going to allow Texas to have their Texas network and be a member. They would have to give up their Texas network. Well, Texas wasn't going to give up a hundred and whatever million. It was a 20 million deal 
uh, at 15 million a year. They weren't going to give that up just to go belong in the Pac-12. They could stay in the Big 12 and have their television package. Why did Nebraska go to the Big 10? You know, Tom Osborne said in the meeting, you know, we deserve to share in the Big 12. They didn't share in the Big 12. Texas took the most, Oklahoma had next. And so Tom Osborne said, if we don't share, we're gone. They didn't share the next year. Tom Osborne calls the, the Big 10. Missouri was primed to go to the Big Ten. <clears throat> Missouri actually would fit the Big Ten academically, locale, but they bypassed Missouri and picked up Nebraska because Nebraska had a bigger name. Well, they didn't, and they had more eyeballs than Missouri. <clears throat> College football fan, and this is – there's very few schools in college football that has a million to two million fans. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to turn the TV on. They're going to buy tickets. They're going to support that team. So where can you get those? When the SEC target started to go to 16 teams, they were going to take Florida uh, State in Miami, and, and they, they were going to go to Texas, Texas, Texas and Those were the four teams other than the 12 that they had. The governor of Texas in Richardson said, you're not going unless you take Baylor and Texas Tech. So Texas being a very political state and Texas being a very very political university, uh, they backed off. And so, and you couldn't because the money that you would get from the, from the state allocations of higher education, uh, you did not want the governor telling you, you're not getting any money. So that was the reason and that the SEC only ended up with 12 teams and then 14 teams rather than 16 teams. Now, fast forward, where are we today? Uh, it's, it hasn't stopped. The Big 12 is, will add four more teams, but it's not going to improve their payout. It's not, not going to improve those eyeballs. The Pac-12 give you an example, from <clears throat> Colorado all the way to the West Coast, there's only 14 to 17 percent that are college football fans. So in that footprint, if I'm an advertiser, am I going to pay X amount of dollars to only have 14 to 17 percent penetration, or can I go and put my dollar in this area that I have 50 to 85% penetration. <clears throat> so that's never going to change. I don't care what any, anybody says. It's, it's eyeballs and it's college football fans. And that's why the SEC in the South, why they have the advantage. Now, if you took Clemson out of the ACC, tell me any other team in the ACC other than Florida State. If you took Clemson and Florida State out of the ACC, do they, any, any stadium have a sellout? Not consistently, no. Yeah. So the difference is you have a couple of teams and those are the two. Now, you know, you had Miami but years ago, but Miami is not a sellout today. No. Nope. You know, Pitt's not a Syracuse. I mean, you go on and on. So <clears throat> now what's the most mind-boggling thing and what people didn't understand, tell me why Rutgers 
Well, they went after Rutgers. The Big Ten. It's very simple. The number one team in the New York market, fan base team, is Rutgers. Yep. Not Notre Dame, not Penn State. So the Big Ten <clears throat> went after Rutgers to get New York. So, you know, throwing those darts, the Big Ten throwing those darts at the SEC, uh, they don't have any room. Those glass houses break very easy when you throw stones. Well, listen, Coach, uh, we want to thank you so very, very much for taking the time tonight on uh, – our college football Tuesday show uh, to join us and go over uh, some great, great stuff for us. We really do appreciate it. You're wel you're welcome. Now, where did you get the nickname Blue Bloods? Um, so uh, when we started our like, so I have another show on top of this one, and we were just trying to think of a name that no other show had, and. Um, I'm from the South SEC, and a lot of the programs that conference are called are like blue blood programs. So I was like, I looked it up. No one had it. I was like, man, this would be a perfect, like, catchy name because we only cover college football. So I was yeah. like, we'll go with the blue bloods in. Well, good luck to you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and be safe, Coach. You too. That was Coach um, Jackie Sherrill, legendary coach, and what a great, great interview. But 